Uh, my name is Mark Allen. I am really pleased to be with you today. Uh, and I'm going to talk about rebar three. Um, the title of this talk is three greater than two. And um, for a long time, I didn't believe this. But uh, recently, I've, I've drank the Kool-Aid. Um, and uh, I'm a really big fan of rebar three. And through this talk, I hope to make you all uh, big fans of rebar three as well. Um, how many of you are currently using rebar two? Anyone? No? Are you already using rebar three now? Yeah? How many of you are like splitters and using uh, Erlang.mk? Yeah, a few of you. OK, that's fine. Uh, if you like Erlang MK uh, and it works for you, then that's great. Um, hopefully, you'll see that there's some really nice features that Rebar has um, added that will encourage you to uh, consider switching. Um, but I understand, like, you, you go with a build system and you invest time in it and you build automation around it, and it's difficult to change. Uh, I do understand that. And I'm sympathetic to that. Um, all right, so uh, let's start with some context um, with the, the tool itself. If you go sort of back into the deep, deep, deep commit history of Rebar, um, you'll see that it started in 2009, um, late in 2009, actually about um, nine years ago, I think, uh, no, eight years ago. Um, it was written by this guy named uh, Dave Smith, who goes by Dizzy. Um, he worked at Basho. And now he's a digital ocean, but um, he still goes by Dizzy. Um, anyway, Dizzy started this uh, build tool, uh, Rebar, um, to help build React releases. And um, if you read the commit history, you can see over time, it's acquired a whole bunch of features. They came in organically. And people were like, hey, uh, this tool is pretty good, and it really helps us save time. Um, you know, the Erlang compiler, is, is the Erl C tool is, is, is adequate. Um, but it, this is really nice because uh, you know it takes care of a lot of uh, issues for us, and um, you know over time has gotten all sorts of compilers for protobufs and uh, C programs and uh, templating files and um, you just all sorts of different things included in inside of the guts of it. And this organic growth of the tool really just led to chaos internally in the tool itself. Um, it was really difficult to add uh, new features easily um, to test features that were added. Um, and also just to generally organize the code in a, in a more coherent and sane way. And so about, I don't know, three or four years ago, uh, Tristan Slaughter uh, started kind of working on a fork of Rebar called Rebar 3. And uh, then uh, Fred Hebert kind of joined in. And together, they've been working on the tool now for uh, at least three years. And it's really gotten very mature. Um, and. Um, some of the things that were really frustrating about Rebar 2, I think, for both of us, and also for me personally, um, was really the dependency management. Um, I don't know how many how many times this has happened to, to y'all, but um, when I have an Erlang um, library and I'm downloading it, and it uses Mech, and Mech is pinned at some version, and then some other application also has Mech as a dependency for testing purposes, and it's pinned at a different version, um, then you're kind of stuck in what I call Mech hell. And um, you know you have these conflicting versions, and you have to have some way to resolve that. And Rebar 2 just sort of threw up its hands, like, I don't know what to do. Um, you're on your own, buddy. Um, and that's not very friendly. That's not a very good experience. Uh, we could do a lot better. Um, so uh, one other thing that was really frustrating, I think, um, for me also, again, in my professional experience, is the lack of repeatable builds. So you would execute a build with Rebar, and it would output some artifact and then later, you wouldn't be able to tell exactly what commits went into that build, right? So you wouldn't be able to say definitively that uh, this library at this commit level went into this artifact. And Rebar 3 really tries to solve and approach um, a lot of these problems. So you know, now there's just something better. So as I said, um, it's a major rework, major rework. The reason that Rebar 3 is sort of a separate thing now is that it broke compatibility with Rebar 2 in really fundamental ways. Um, a couple of the really important changes that happened between 2 and 3 is that RHEL tool was the sort of release tool. I'm going to talk about this later more in my talk. But RHEL tool was the tool that was integrated into Rebar originally. RHEL tool is, uh, comes with the OTP release. It's bundled with, with Erlang directly. Um, and a lot of people don't like it. And um, actually, the syntax, if you go read the man page for it, is quite um, arcane. Um, it's really only for wizards, and I'm not a wizard, and I don't know many wizards. Um, I know a few of them. I've met a couple of them um, at uh, 
various Erlang events, but I mean, generally speaking, uh, if you're not a wizard, RHEL tool is probably not what you want to be building your releases with. So um, they put in Relax, uh, Relx, I guess it's also called sometimes. Um, and there's also a lock file. So this, this, uh, the lock file is intended to address that issue where you have repeatable build concerns, right? So you want to know this library, this commit went into this artifact, and it's repeatable. Every single time you ask Rebar to build or compile this artifact, it's going to be those libraries, this commit level, that's your output. So it, um, you won't be able to get the same hashes necessarily because of the way that Erlang actually encodes time information into beam files. Um, this is actually quite irritating. Uh, <laughs> as, as, a, as an engineer, uh, I think they've uh, added an option in OTP20 to turn that off. But um, it used to be that uh, Erlang modules had a version ID that was assigned by the compiler, and it was based on a timestamp. And what that meant is, is that if you hashed two, two beam files and they were built at different times, they could be completely identical, except they won't hash to the same value. Um, and so that's, that's kind of irritating. Um, but uh, some other great things about Rebar 3 that I really like, just on highlights here, is hex integration. We're going to talk a lot about what hex is. How many of you know what hex is already? Quite a few. OK, good. So um, hex is a package repository that um, started up a couple years ago. Um, it was really started by uh, Eric um, um, Meadows Janssen, I think that's his name. Uh, he's an Elixir guy, and um, he's on the Elixir core team. And he's really, really cool. Um, nice guy. Met him a couple times. Uh, he he is, uh, started this project called Hex to kind of be a package repository. And um, one of the other issues that I have about Erlang builds in general is that until really recently, until Hex kind of came about, um, there wasn't sort of a, of a, quote, definitive place to put your, your Erlang artifacts, right? So you could throw code up on GitHub, and then you're kind of in this weird spot where uh, you know, there's forks and forks and forks, especially, I mean, just think about um, like MySQL support. You know, there's like 85 different uh, MySQL drivers um, to talk to MySQL. And some of them are like abandoned, some of them are bit rotted, some of them are terrible, some of them are not terrible, but it's like as a, someone that's coming to the language, we could do a lot better to help people find out, okay, these pieces of code are like really quality, a lot of people use them, they're widely used in the community, all those sorts of things. The, all, the all the indicators of quality have been very difficult to signal um, just by relying on something like GitHub by itself. And um, so with Hex, we don't really have to do that anymore, and that's also a really nice thing I like. Um, so uh, let me tell you a story. Um, I'm not implying, by the way, that Rebar 3 is as beautiful as the Taj Mahal, but uh, it's pretty nice. Um, also, I had an observation, um, which is when you, have, when, you, when you take a drink of something and it's really terrible, you don't keep it to yourself, right? You say, here, try this. It's so terrible, right? You say, oh, this is awful. Got to have some. Um, why don't we do that for nice things, right? Why don't, why don't we try that for, for things that taste really delicious, right? It's like, oh, this is so wonderful. You should have some. Uh, we, we, I don't know. Maybe we're just too greedy or something. But uh, what I wanted to tell you is, is that for a long time, I was kind of in the ambivalent camp about Rebar 3, right? I could take it or leave it. Um, in the last two years, I've really become a believer. And what I want to do with this slide and, and, and with this little segment of my talk is encourage you to give it a shot. Um, if you've been using Rebar 2, um, get, you know, just dip your toe in the water of Rebar 3. And I think that as you use it more, you really come to like all the features that it's added to um, the capabilities that you can have. And what this talk is really focused on is kind of customizing Rebar to make it the best possible build tool for you. Um, or even for your company, or for your colleagues, or your team, right? Um, Rebar 3 offers you a level of customization that we've, we've never had before. Um, and uh, and I, I think that's really exciting, that you'll have the opportunity to, um, to customize your build tool to do exactly what you want to do, and not you know, what someone else wanted to do, and have to go through you know, submitting patches upstream and all those sorts of things. Okay, um, so we're just going to run through some of the basic operations um, to start with, just to kind of level set everything. Um, the first thing that's really important is dependencies. So um, one, of the, one of the weird things about uh, Rebar 2 was is that you had to explicitly ask Rebar 2 to pull dependencies. Um, now, there is an actual, uh, if you, again, if you sort of dive back into the commit history of Rebar 2, there is a lot of, um, there's an explicit commit that Dizzy added, like in 2010, um, like a year after he started Rebar project directly, it says that you have to explicitly, I guess that used to automatically fetch dependencies. 
And then at some point, that was not a good choice, okay? And so uh, Dizzy changed it so that you had to explicitly fetch. And I'm not trying to throw Dizzy under the bus, by the way. Hey, Dizzy, if you're watching, hi. Um, uh, I'm not trying to throw him under the bus, but there was a decision made at some point where this getting dependencies automatically was decided to be a bad thing. And so you had to explicitly ask rebar to pull your depths, right? There's this rebar get depths uh, command that rebar2 uses and supports. And that's what fetches your depths from whatever sources you have defined in your config file. Um, that, that, that is not any longer the case. So rebar3 um, actually has sort of a, a tree approach to handling commands. And the commands know that um, there might be precursors and ancestors that follow a, a certain command. So for example, if you tell rebar3 to compile a piece of code, and you have dependencies defined in your um, rebar config file, the first thing it's going to do is um, go out and check to see are the dependencies already present on your system. Um, and it's going to look in the, the underscore build directory. So that's where rebar puts all of its artifacts now is in the underscore build. It used to go into a depth directory, right, if you use rebar2. But now in rebar3, it goes into build. And then underneath that, there's some profiles, right? The normal one is default. That's the one that 99% of people use. Um, and today, hopefully, maybe you'll get more comfortable with other profiles. But um, so they go into um, build default lib, and then that's where all the dependencies end up. And so it'll go in there and check and see if they're the right version, and then it'll check the lock file that gets created. If there's a lock file, it will go check that, make sure that your versions are right. And if they're not, it'll try to get the right version and put it in place. Um, and then the other nice thing is that um, if you pull dependencies from hex, it will cache those locally on your system. So like let's say that you're on an airplane or whatever and you know airplanes have terrible Wi-Fi. So you could grab them at the airport before you go to get on the plane and then you know you'll have your dependencies already set in your project and you're actually sitting in your seat and you're ready to write code. Um, so it's really nice. Um, some of the other things that are, are great is, is the profiles. I already mentioned those a little bit. Um, you get out of this mech hell by putting all your test dependencies in a test profile and you can even put dependencies in for EDOC and other targets and stuff like that. Um, so it's really great. You can um, segment what dependencies get downloaded based on what sort of profile you're executing. And I think that that's a really nice advancement in terms of you know, uh, how much clutter you have to think about, how much overhead you're going to have. Um, and also tries to put out uh, these fires of, OK, well, this project uses that version of Mac, and this project uses that version of Mac, and they're not the same. Um, you know, this, this can go a long way to solving that, that problem. I think that's great. OK, um, so rebar3 shell. Um, this is uh, this is this is the goat. This is a goat. It's a goat emoticon. Um, it's the greatest of all time. Okay, it's the greatest of all time. This thing is it's my favorite thing. Um, you just type rebar three shell, and what it does is it will download all your dependencies, compile your project, and it will actually put you right into an Erlang REPL. And um, you can even go one further and tell it to start your application and tell it to read a config file. So you can do all that from the command line. It's super super convenient. It's really great for testing and experimenting. Um, this is really absolutely my favorite feature about Rebar 3. And this one feature alone is enough, I hope, to sort of push you over the edge and get you to try it. Um, it's really, really nice. Um, now, you can certainly do this, and, um, and, and I worked at Basho too, so I mean, a lot of Basho make files have a target called shell, um, you know, where you type make shell and it does the same thing. Um, but this is built in and it works on everything. <laughs> so you don't have to write any make files or anything like that. You just get it, and it's really lovely. Um, definitely worth, worth the time. Um, so I already mentioned integration with Hex. Um, one of the other things that's really neat about um, the Hex integration is that you can actually publish your own code to Hex. So um, Rebar3 gives you a direct route to, uh, to go ahead and publish your code. Um, there's also a, this notion of a global config file. So all of the Hex um, stuff is encoded in a, in a global um, uh, plugin. And um, you can put those in this path here. By the way, uh, this, all the slides and everything I'm going to upload those, uh, so you know you don't need to take notes unless you want to. Um, but you put them, you put the rebar hex uh, in your global profile, and then what you can do is register yourself as a user, and um, you can add some extra metadata to your um, your dot app dot source, like here. Uh, this is a project that I have for sagas, um, right? And so here's my maintainer information, here's the licensing information, and then here's some links. And wh when this data gets processed by hex, when you say upload it, right, when you say hex publish, it outputs all of this nice output stuff here for you. And um, at the bottom, at the bottom, sorry, it's hard to read. Um, at the bottom, it can actually go ahead and publish it directly, and it will send up the tarball, and hex will process it. 
and all that metadata information will get presented in a really nice little web UI um, for people to look at and to evaluate. So that's pretty neat. Um, all right, um, so let's talk about releases a little bit. Um, who is uh, doing releases already? Yeah, you, okay, so a release is uh, really a collection of an application and its dependencies, and it's sort of matched up with the Erlang runtime. The idea here is that you wanna build an artifact that you're ready to deploy to something else, right? Like you wanna push it to production, or um, you, know, you wanna put it into a, a, um, a CI service or something like that. Um, so a release is really a uh, collection of, of um, a library plus all of its dependencies um, in some sort of way that you can um, manage it to be an artifact, right? And when I say artifact, what I mean is a tarball, right? Or um, depending on if you have dev mode enabled. Um, so I mentioned rel tool already, it's for wizards. Um, I'm not a wizard, I don't know any wizards. I know a few wizards, but you know, they're rare. They're rare. Um, and uh, so rebar three uses relics which is a, a really nice tool. Um, and uh, there, is a, there is a Relix um, project. So if, um, if you're new to Relix, and I know I was, especially when I started with Rebar, um, it's really worth your time to sort of get familiar with that. But the really basic way to, to handle this is, um, you know, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, I stole this out of a, a project that I started, um, that I actually presented in my workshop yesterday. Um, so Udon is a React Core example application. Um, and here's the, here's the relics configuration for that. Um, you can see up here at the top, um, there's this keyword release and then the name of the app and then a version. Um, and then I have the dependencies that come with it. And um, here, this dev mode thing is really interesting. Um, what that means is that I don't wanna create a tarball. Um, I want you to lay out the apps. Um, I want you to lay out the app as, it, as if it were going to be a tarball, but just symlink all the application dependencies don't actually copy them in place. Um, and what this lets you do is simply re-symlink those things as, as this changes. So as you're developing an app and you wanna do release and test the release, um, having dev mode enabled is a really nice and fast way to get a lot of, um, to get a lot of mileage out of uh, getting those dependencies in the right place, okay? Um, and then this is include early runtime, false for dev mode, um, and then you have the overlay vars. And what this does is it sets up your release directory the way that you want it. If you have config files or you have um, you know, uh, a certain directory layout that your application expects, like it needs to write data into a certain directory or whatever, um, these overlays, bars, and um, template uh, files can help you uh, create that environment very quickly and easily. Um, one really nice thing about this method is that you can have specific overlays for specific releases. So um, for example, if you have a, if you have a prod release, if you have a prod release here, so if you just want to do a normal release, you can just tell rebar release, and that means dev mode on, right? So just symlink my, my, de my dependencies. But then down here, if I say rebar three as prod release tar, that means dev mode off. So I want the runtime, I want all the apps, I want them all copied into the right place, and then I want you to, I want you rebar, I want you to create a tarball and gzip it. And so that at the end of this process, I'm gonna have a complete artifact, right? With repeatable build, rebar lock, all that stuff. Um, in a nice little artifact, a tarball, that I can deploy to whatever I need to send it to, right? It could be a, a customer site, it could be uh, a deployment server, it could be a CI system, whatever, whatever the case may be. Okay, are there any questions so far? Yeah. Um, so that's a good question. The question was, uh, is the application order uh, here, is that meaningful? Um, the answer is no. It's really just the list of applications, what they should be copied. The startup order of your applications is defined by the metadata that's in the application directory itself. Um, so that would be like your app.source, and then if you have any kind of other start stanzas inside of your source code. So um, yeah, that is a good question though, thank you. Um, any other questions? Okay, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, can you, do you have an example, like specific example or? Um, because my experience has been, my experience has been, uh, so 
So the question was, uh, rebar is great, and I agree with that. Um, it, what, what is, sometimes some of the features are not properly documented, and what, what, what can we do about that? Um, and, uh, and I agree, I think the documentation could be better. There certainly could be more of it. Um, and, and I think this talk is hopefully an attempt to, to do that. Um, but, you know, the, um, my, my experience has generally been when I needed a feature, I found an example. Um, and I do have a resource slide at the end of this. Um, if I find something that's not well documented or is not working correctly, um, there's, a, there's an IRC channel on Freenode. Um, and IRC is like a Slack for old people. I'm old, by the way. Um, so IRC is Slack for old people. And um, there's a rebar channel on, on uh, IRC. And um, Tristan and Fred are in there almost all the time. So um, you can ask questions in the channel, and someone will help you. Um, and if it's a legitimate problem or a bug or whatever, um, they usually know about it already. <laughs> that's been my experience. So if I find something that's really weird about rebar 3, I go to the IRC channel, and I ask for help in there. And they've been super good about helping me. Um, so that would be my first suggestion. Um, but you know, in general, uh, I, I agree that I think there could be more documentation. I think the documentation that comes with rebar is actually reasonably pretty good, at least for at the high level first gloss, right? So um, some of the other more obscure things like uh, plugins and whatever, uh, I do have some examples uh, that we're going to talk about today um, on that topic. But um, generally speaking, it's it's uh, you know um, it's pretty good. I think especially for just basic usage, it's, it's really Adequate. Yeah, agree. Yeah. Yes. So I'll tell you the weirdest part of, about Rebar 3, uh, just since the question prompted it. Um, I, I do have a couple of slides about templating. Um, and uh, oh, yeah, here it is. Boom. Templates. Um, so the weirdest part about Rebar 3 for me was the templating language. The templating language is, um, is this thing called Mustache. Okay, and uh, mustache is really is kind of a weird templating language. It doesn't like so in a normal templating like normal in a normal templating language, you have these constructs where you can like iterate over lists and stuff like that. And mustache, there aren't those there aren't those constructs. So um, you have to think really hard about how you want to how you want to explode out uh, collections. Um, and I mean, you can you can totally do it, and I have done it. Um, it's just that you have to think about it uh, more than you normally would, like if you were using uh, sort of uh, early DTL style templates or um, the Elixir templating language, uh, EEX, has all of these sort of iterative things that are really nice. You don't have to think about it there. You just you know, put it in and it like, gives you an instance and boom, you just you know, stamp these things out. But with Mustache, you actually have to think about it for a little bit. Um, so that's been the weirdest part about sort of getting Rebar 3 to do exactly as I want. <laughs> Uh, I'll write a template or whatever, and it doesn't come out right, so I'll have to like try it again and try it again and try it again and try it again. And that's mostly about my mental model about how mustache should work, um, and not with the tool itself. But um, anyway, so uh, so that's that's been the weirdest part about about that. And I've actually found um, resources about using mustache um, surprisingly difficult to find as well, especially about dealing with loops and stuff like that. Um, most of the time, they just point you to the band page, and there's like one, there's exactly one example about how to use loops on that man page. And uh, if you're not doing that one example, then it's kind of like, I don't know. Um, so it's, it's, it's a little bit weird, but all right. Um, so templates. Templates are really great. Um, and there are a ton of them that are built in. And you can see how many of these are built in. You can see they're all labeled built in. Um, and there's actually one here that's not labeled built in. It's this one. Um, so if you're writing React Core applications, like we did in my workshop yesterday, um, there's actually a template pack that you can install. And once you do that, then you can have a nice, neat new way to stamp out new React Core applications really quickly um, and just ready to, ready to go, right? So um, building templates for your application stack is a really, really useful technique. And this is something that we do at my company. Um, we have a, a rebar plugin, and it has a set of templates uh, associated with it that uh, map to our internal web framework. So we have a microservice web framework that's written in Erlang. And um, when we want to create a new service, we can just ask Rebar to go ahead and create a new template file so that we can quickly write um, a new microservice that, sits, that fits into our, our framework there. Um, I already um, talked a little bit about template variables. So, um, so here's the, the weird mustache language. Um, how do these, yeah, question. Uh -huh. Okay. 
Oh yeah? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So the, the comment was is that um, there's a Java implementation of Mustache which has really good docs. Um, so if you get stuck, that's a good point, thank you. Uh, if you get stuck, um, check there. Yeah, question? And, and I heard there's one, there, I guess there's a comment about JavaScript, so you can check mustache and JavaScript too. I guess they have they have better examples. That's nice. Um, okay, so uh, here, here's the weird mustache language, and you can see up here there's this like uh, double bracket, double bracket, and there's this variable in here. Um, the question is, how do you get values in that? Well, the answer to that is this. Um, when you have all these templates, they actually have a whole bunch of variables, which you can see here, right? And it tells you what, what the variable is, what its default value is, and then what this actually means, right? Like in the context of this template. Um, and so this is a great way for you to be able to customize your templates um, at, at creation time. You can just pass these parameters in on the command line, and Rebar 3 will do the right thing with them. Um, it will put them into the mustache template. Like if, um, for example, if I had a custom template that um, stamped out this weird example, um, one of the parameters I have is name. And so I would pass name on the command line. And then when this gets rendered, the name, this little squiggly, squiggly name thing would be replaced with the actual name I passed, right? So that's super clear. Um, mustache is great for really obvious um, templating tasks like this. Um, but like I said, it is, is a little bit more complex for, uh, for loops and uh, uh, collections. Okay, um, so uh, let's talk about uh, custom rebar three um, plugins. Uh, looks like I have 20 minutes left. Yeah, 20. Okay, cool. Um, so um, this is a really huge topic. I could do a whole talk just about rebar three plugins. To be honest, um, it's it's it is a very large topic. Um, but there is help that's on the way. Um, one of the great examples and the one that we're going to use today is, is actually this one here. It's sort of a tutorial. And what it is is a plugin that searches through your files and looks for the phrase to do. And then it outputs them. So you can tell Rebar3, hey, um, I want you to show me all my to do items. Um, and it will just search through your source code directory. And every time there's a to do in a comment, it'll actually output it. It'll emit it on standard out. So you can keep track of what those are. And maybe it'll be like, oh, hey, uh, I was supposed to fix that problem and uh, I haven't gotten to it yet, right? So that's the purpose of what the plugin is to do. Um, but the, the main thing is, is that you're gonna write three callback functions. The callbacks are this. So you get an init function that takes a state and it returns a new state. Um, and then there's this do function that also takes a state and returns a new state or errors. And then format error, right? And then it returns a string. And um, you can also have uh, plugins that have their own templates. I mentioned that already. Uh, we, that's something that we have. Uh, for our custom plugin for rebar. And um, to install these in a global way so you don't have to put them in your rebar config file, like every single project, you can, there's a global rebar config file in rebar 3. And you can just put your plugins there as a list and it will just use them. So um, it's really, really nice for in house frameworks. So it's one of my bullet points, um, but I'll just reiterate it. It is really, really nice uh, for that. Okay, so um, this is a, an initial, initialization step here. Um, I know this is a wall of code, but it's actually quite simple. Um, really what we're doing is just creating sort of a, a prop list. That's really what this is, is a prop list, and it's got these keys and values over here. And the keys are really um, standardized. And this all comes from a provider library that Tristan wrote uh, a couple years ago. Um, that's, that's why these things are called providers, um, because there is actually a library called providers. Um, and that's what Rebar uses to implement this functionality. So um, there's the name and the module. Those are self-explanatory. This is a weird one, but basically it says that the task can always be run by the user, so you just want to do that. And then depths is the list of dependencies. Um, in this case, it is whether or not you should um, allow the plugin to descend into dependencies or not, okay? Um, and then there's an example, and this is uh, used for help messages. And then here's your options. So this is like uh, the, the parameters or flags that your plugin will take on the command line. And you can see that there is one here, it's, it's minus D, um, and it, uh, it, its default value is undefined. So that means that it's, it's uh, you know, normally not used. And then short desk, again, this is uh, for help messages, and then this is also for help messages. So the idea here is that we, really, we want to try to be really friendly um, for outputting help messages when, you, when users encounter your plugin, um, how they should consume it and what they should pass into it and things like that. Um, the most important part is this part down here at the bottom. Again, sorry for the bottom slide. Um, it's rebar state add provider. 
That's the thing that actually clues rebar in and says, hey, um, dynamically add this plugin to the list of things that a user could possibly do. So this um, init function gets executed before any evaluation of your code, before any compiling, before it even looks for source code or anything like that. So this init function um, is executed across all the plugins first, um, and then later it does all the command line parsing and stuff like that. So um, the, the, the bottom part here, the rebar state thing, that's the most important part of this, this whole deal. Um, the next part is the action. So what should we do? Um, and you can see here that this is a really straightforward thing. The first thing is we're gonna discover type. So that's carried around in the state. The state is rebar state. And so that has like all the applications that rebar scan and the dependency list and all of that stuff. It's all carried around in that variable state. And there's a whole bunch of helper functions that rebar exposes to you so that you can execute or pull things out of state like you can see here that rebar state project apps are pulled out is the thing that we're gonna search through. Um, so that's what this does, is at first is it figures out, am I looking at the normal project files or dependencies? And if I am, then I'm gonna get a list of dependencies, and if I'm not, then I'm gonna look at just the, the top level application stuff. It goes into that list apps, and then we're just gonna do a for each, right? So there's this little function called check to do app, and what that does is it scans through the source code, and it looks for the phrase to do. So if it finds the literal match of to do, then it will emit that on standard out, okay? and then it returns okay state. We didn't modify the state, so we're just gonna pass it through. And then format error, really straightforward, right? It's an error, um, and it just formats it and puts it out in an I list, and that's it, okay? Those are the only three callbacks that you need to have for a plugin. Okay, this is a really simple example, and I understand a lot of complexity here, um, but uh, it's really not that difficult, and it's, it's uh, kind of fun, actually, when you get started with it. Um, once you start really getting into the rebar API, um, there's a lot that you can do. Um, you can define your own custom compilers. Um, you can change the way that rebar does certain activities, like pulling dependencies. Um, you can change how it uh, looks for code to compile. You can change the output directories where it drops places. Um, you can just do all sorts of really interesting things um, to make your build process customized for your environment and for your own work style. And I think that's really great. Um, it's not possible to do with rebar 2. Rebar 3 supports it. I think that's really cool. So. Um, I just wanted to spend a few minutes talking about converting to rebar three. This is the boat that I was in, especially um, uh, with some projects that I maintain. So um, the, the, I wrote sort of a checklist here. Um, the most important thing that I found is that you want to sort of update your dependencies to the new style. And what I mean by that is that in rebar three, um, the, the version check thing that rebar two had, it doesn't, it doesn't exist, it doesn't use that, okay? So um, uh, I personally like to use the hex style, which is just an atom. Right? It's just an atom of a project name, and that maps to a whole hex download and all that stuff. You can also give um, other options. There, there's three or four different options that you can use. But the most common that you'll see is just a naked atom with a, um, with a project name, and then also there'll sometimes be a version specifier. Uh, that, that's also in, uh, common. Um, so that's, that's number one. Number two is move your tests and doc dependencies out of the sort of main line. Create profiles for them. Profiles are really helpful and, and powerful. Um, and those profiles automatically get created when you execute the test target. So for example, if you have a profile named test, you don't have to explicitly ask Rebar to use the test profile. It's smart enough to know that you should check to see if it exists, and if it does, to use the dependencies in there, okay? Um, and then finally, if you need to, um, you're gonna have to include the Relics dependency, or the release uh, specifiers. Um, Rel tool is uh, for wizards, but also uh, Rebar 2 hit a lot of the complexity of Rel tool, um, and so, it, it actually made rel tool more approachable, I think, than it actually is as a tool. Um, that's good and bad. Um, it hid the complexity from you. Um, but relics is also not that difficult, and uh, it's, uh, it's pretty easy. Um, and then finally, if you need to uh, provide rebar 2 compatibility, there's still a lot of people in the world that are using rebar 2, and you don't want to you know, force them to use rebar 3. Uh, that's, that's not very nice. So be considerate, um, provide compatibility. Um, I have an example here. I, I maintain a project called Logger, which is a logging library. Um, here's Logger's Rebar 3 dependency um, config. Um, this is just some extra stuff I copied in here to give context. Um, these, these actually probably should be in their test profile, and I haven't done that yet, but you can see that it doesn't really matter, because Rebar 3 is really tolerant. It just ignores stuff that it doesn't understand, um, and so does Rebar 2, for that matter. Um, anyway, um, down here is the dependencies. It's, there's only one dependency for Logger. It's Gold Rush, and it has this, this version specifier. Um, and, yep, there it is, highlighted. Um, and then there's a logger rebar 2 compatibility, and it's in, it's in this file, and this is the secret. Um, 
this is one of those things I think that's under documented actually, is that, that you can create a rebar config script. And what that does is uh, when rebar starts, it looks for this file. If, there's a, if there is this file in, in the current working directory, then it will actually execute it. It will load it and, and evaluate, evaluate it. Um, and in this case, what we can do is this. We can say if the function is exported rebar3 main, then we know we're using rebar3. And in that case, we can just pass through this config. Where did this config thing come from? It's magic. Um, it didn't come from anywhere. It's not specified in here, as you can see. Um, but it's like the magic thing that says, here's the config that rebar's read off the disk. Um, and it gives you the chance to modify it, which is exactly what we do down here. So if we're compiling with rebar2, you can see I have the old style dependency here with gold rush and this little uh, regular expression thing. And then you know the specification for where to pull this from and, and the version that I want and all that. And then I delete. I delete the depths key from rebar3 and I replace it with, with this uh, tuple uh, or list, sorry, um, and return it, right? And that's, that's how I maintain rebar2 compatibility with a project that has rebar3 style dependencies. Um, you can do this same technique for all the things that need to be fixed and replaced for rebar2. Um, and so it, this is a nice way for you to bridge that uh, transition time where people are kind of still using rebar2 and rebar3 together. All right, so uh, one last thing I wanted to mention. Um, rebar3 has a debug facility. Um, and if things blow up, go boom. Um, you can actually just pass in debug minus one over here um, and run a command. And it will give you verbose output. It'll show you every single step that it's doing um, and tell you what all the internal states of rebar are. This is really, really helpful if you're going to file a bug report like, you know, or ask for help or whatever. You can take that output and put it in a gist or some paste bin or whatever, and then ask for help in IRC, and people can take a look at it and try to help you figure out what's, what's broken. Um, so here's some great resources. Um, of course, the main sort of doc website is this one, rebar3.org. Um, if you want to look at the GitHub source code um, and play around with it, that's where it is. It's on uh, Erlang Rebar3. Um, I already mentioned the, the uh, hashtag rebar channel on IRC. Um, and then uh, there's a couple of YouTube videos uh, that if you haven't seen are really worth watching. Um, the first one is this one, um, the introduction to Rebar 3. That's where Fred and Tristan sort of introduced the tool itself um, at Erlang Factory. And then uh, they did another talk the year after. This is from 2016, where they talk about moving from 2 to 3 um, in the same vein as kind of what this talk is, but it's a little more elementary. Um, and that's also a great video. They're, both of those videos are about 40 minutes each. And then finally, um, I mentioned Hex. Uh, if you haven't played around with it, it's really neat. So uh, maybe spend a, spend a minute or two and take a look at it. Uh, it's, it's really, really great. And um, I think that's it. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. I'm happy to take any questions that people might have. Yeah, questions. They don't really play with hex. Okay. They, do, they, they don't have a previous state to actually pull the hex and then read. Can we uh, optionally choose hex and some uh, sometimes not to choose hex? Or can it fall back when hex isn't available uh, to put? Oh, you're, you're saying that, uh, that rebar doesn't have access to talk to hex or? Yeah. It, I mean, it, it doesn't have a state. Uh, the, the CI systems don't really have a, a, a file system structure to, you know, keep that. Okay. So um, when I mentioned just an atom there saying that pull me cowboy, now it doesn't really understand where the cowboy is. Okay. Um, can is there a configuration where we can say where we can define such a way that if there is a hex package available, it pulls it from there. When it's not available, it just goes and uh, takes it. Um, there currently is not a fallback mechanism. Um, that's actually one of the things that that I have been asking for. And uh, th just just as an aside, I actually hope I can demo this uh, a little bit later uh, during our lunch time. But um, I have a um, I've been working off and on on a service that allows you to store re um, that allows you to store hex style artifacts, but not in hex. Okay. <laughs> okay. So it's something that's behind your firewall, right? But it would store your own like private artifacts that would be generated through uploads. Um, and currently, there's no way to say. Uh, try this repo and then try this repo and then try this repo. Unfortunately, it's a all or nothing type deal where it either gets it or it does not get it right now. But hopefully that will change in the future. So. Okay. No, I've, I'm writing a I'm writing a server, 
So the question was, am I using Nexus? Um, no, I'm, I'm writing my own server to do that. So yeah, question, comment. Yeah. Okay. Two questions, actually. Yeah. So right. One is, uh, do you know of any resources for specking? I saw that you've specked out stuff in your uh, library that you maintain. Uh, that's the first question. The second question is, uh, is the type check dialyzer part of the rebar builds that you have? It is, yeah. So rebar has a, has a dialyzer build uh, target. Um, so you can actually type rebar3 dialyzer, and it will go ahead and build you a PLT and an XP, uh, dialyzer run. Um, as far as uh, resources on specking, the best resource I've personally found is actually in the Erlang documentation directly. Um, maybe there ought to be a more of a, a discussion around that. Um, I know that uh, Costas uh, Sagonis um, couldn't be here. Unfortunately, he had a visa issue. He was going to be here, but um, uh, he's, he's like the world's expert on specking because um, he invented it. <laughs> and uh, so um, uh, he's also done some uh, talks at Erlang factories and other things that are available on the internet where uh, he discusses how specs work and what they're intended to do. So uh, I, would, I would ask uh, or recommend that you check that out. Yeah. A yeah, question away in the back, please. Uh, not exactly a question, but a response to one of the previous questions. Okay. Uh, with uh, being able to uh, get your dependencies either from hex or from source repositories in a CI system, that's probably locked to the network. So. Uh, I have solved a similar problem recently, essentially repeatable builds, uh -huh. where uh, the rebar locks and mixed dot lock are not sufficient to okay. ensure repeatability. Okay. So uh, I have done it using Mix, a functional package manager. Okay. Uh, and its standard library has a few functions uh, that are already defined, which allow you to build a rebar project or a mix project or okay. an Erlang MK project, okay. where you can freeze. Uh, the contents of your dependencies by their content hash. Okay. So that you are guaranteed that you get the same uh, values. Cool. And you can, uh, instead of having ne network access, you can prefetch them into your uh, uh, CA system. Okay. And it will automatically detect that the expected content hash is the same as something on disk and mm -hmm. it will replace them transparently. Okay. I'm planning to give a lightning talk on the same, so for more okay. details, you can. Uh, All right, cool. Uh, so, so the the comment was about uh, using Nix to to guarantee repeatable builds based on hashes of the artifacts that you want to use. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the, the yeah. Yeah. So the, so yeah. So the question was about can we update um, configs dynamically using plugins? Um, the answer to that question is yes. Uh, that is totally possible to do. Um, I'm not aware of a plugin that does that currently, but uh, it sounds like a great project. Oh, you already have one. Oh, all right then. Uh huh. Oh, cool. Okay. So is that a is that a mix only thing or? Okay, so great. Uh, what's the name of the what's the name of the plugin? Okay, so okay, great. So it's rebar elixir compile, right? Okay, cool. That sounds really great. I'll have to check that out. Um, anything else? Any other questions, comments? Okay, uh, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate you being here. Thanks.